Guys, today, heavy things lightly, Vesper Stamper, novelist and illustrator, one of my favorite people. Just hung out with her down at Symbolic World. She was a marvelous speaker. She was all. She will also be our speaker, one of our guest speakers with Richard Rowland at the Art of Tomada, July 7, 8, 9, 10. We talk about that. We talk about her books. We talk about her motivations. But we also hear from one of, she's writing a book and she quotes from it what she thinks she must include, a beautiful dream about Eros, about love. You got to check it out. Today, Vesper Stamper on Heavy Things Lightly. Oh my gosh, Vesper. So you're there. We were we were hanging in uh in Tampa at Symbolic World. Guys, this is Vesper Stamper. So I knew your husband first through through the through the grapevines. And he's still gonna come to Mozambique and work on our and just go there and make a movie, damn it. <laughs> ben Stamper is a movie, is a filmmaker of of great repute. Can I say it like that? He is. Yeah, I mean, he is in my house, so that works. Yes, that's right. I, that totally works. Uh, but first of all, guys, this is Vesper. She's an illustrator, a writer. We'll get into that. But we're going to go do Art of Tamada. So people listening who may not know, First Things does a fundraiser called the art of Tamara, but it's really a weekend of way more than fun. It's like a deep dive into the philosophical and spiritual nature of hospitality. And Vesper is one of our speakers. You're coming out to a sleeping lady resort in Washington near Seattle, uh, July 7th through 10th. So we're going to have to, it was a pretty good time. It's about world. We threw a dinner for the symbolic world VIP cats. You were there. You toasted. Good times were had. Yeah. Don't you think it was good? Be honest. Did you have a good time or are you feeling like I had an eh, I had an amazing time? It was it. actually, I will say, life changing, paradigm changing. You know, guys, she did say that that night. I don't know if you remember that. You did say that that night. Oh, did what? I? Okay. Yeah, you, you it said must something. Be true. You, right. So she's not BSing. Well, everybody BSes a little bit. So what was so what was not so me. great about it? <laughs> No, you don't. You don't. Guys, you should have seen her talk at Symbolic World. Oh, <laughs> no, no, trust me. Very highly tuned BS meter. <laughs> at Symbolic World, guys, go look. I don't know if it's behind a paywall. Do you know if your speech is behind a paywall from Jonathan Pedro? Great Pedro's question. Stuff? I have not looked yet. Yeah. Oh, look at you. You're like the best kind of person. You're like, maybe. But guys, if you can go without the paywall, look up Vesper's speech. That thing was amazing. But the table... It kind of goes with your speech about authenticity or something, or like the idea that we have to wake up, you know, something like that. I I don't know, wake up or or go back into the dream somehow. I don't know, but it was the realest. I think that dinner was just the realest, you know, it's like recovering something important. Yeah. The Georgians have given us um, a pearl we have to take care of us, meaning in, in, in particular, me and my family, we've been doing this for a long time, 20 years, but they have maintained this tradition that is liturgical without being in the church. It has, it has this deep, like this, this emergence of creation, like comes through the toast and, and there's something real natural about it, even though it feels really um, formal, it's not, it's like, Oh, this is what it's like to have a really fun time in a what seems to be a formal setting. And um, I'm really thankful to them for that. So guys, come out and, and find Vesper out there. Richard Rowan's gonna speak as well. I'm gonna nice. I'm gonna talk. But we're gonna we're gonna eat and feast and some live music. In fact, we got that jazz singer, that one jazz singer named Georgia. She's coming, my my kid, uh, the Juilliard jazz singer. That's nepotism. Are you okay with that? I'm fine with nepotism. Yes, You're cool with that, 100%. Right? Yeah, as okay. long as the person is actually you know, okay. good. <laughs> so, <laughs> actually Georgia. competent. Listen, I mean, you know, growing up in New York City, you know that like every highway project is done by someone's cousin. So that, right? you just I hope that, that the cousin right? is competent. That's right. That's how it goes. 
That's the old world too. That's Africa. They'll be like, I'll be hiring right. my two cousins. I'm like, I'm pretty sure those guys don't know how to read. You're like, well, yeah. we're going to get through it. So, you know, an yeah. engineering degree is good, right? For, you know, if you're going to build a bridge. Yeah. If you're going to sing some good. songs, you should have done that once or twice. Yeah. That would be good. All right. All right, Vesper. Here's another thing. Tell us about your writing projects that's going on. But I really, here's my question for your, for your, as for your professional life, which is an amazing professional life. Where, where's the love located? How did it happen to you that you knew like, damn, I love this. And that, which of course became a type of power source for, for your illustrations, for your, for your, for your writing, to become an author. Where's where where that love? How do you identify it? What is it that drives you? I mean, I, I was never not doing it. So as a kid, you know, I just always had a crayon in my hand or a pencil or some such. And I was immersed in a, in a good story, you know, mm. fairy tales that it wasn't a lot of, there wasn't the proliferation of children's entertainment that there is now and access to it. It was like, you know, you knew that electric company was coming on PBS yeah, at yes, yes, that's right, that's 4 30 right. PM after school. And that's what you did, you know, but other mm. than that, you know, you were, off in your own world. So I just, I loved that world so much that I thought, well, there's no plan B for me. I have to be able to make, to make books and to do, you know, to, to make the kinds of books that I love for other kids. So. And then what happened? Was there a threshold where you went from loving it and participating in it as a young person to realizing like, I'm this thing now I write. Did, how did that happen? The writing came much later, but the art as a potential career kind of came in eighth grade. Oh, really? Yeah, because I learned about this high school in Manhattan, this specialized high school named LaGuardia, and it was an arts high school. And I thought, oh my gosh, I don't have to go to... I don't have to go with these same people who have been torturing me all through elementary and middle school. Yeah, you know, right. I don't have to do that to high school too. I can actually go in this other direction with other people who are like me. And, um, that's what I did. I went to LaGuardia high school and it was like, they took all the misfits, you know, from all the five boroughs yeah. and just kind of put us in this one building. And it was awesome. Do you know, I taught at Martin Luther King high school right next to you. Come on. you Wow. I, I, okay. That's a that, tough school. That's a, that that's a, high school is rough. That's a serious school. And I, uh, I did serious teaching in there and you were right across the way probably or not. That's maybe at so the same funny. time. But I don't know if we should say the years that we were there, that might be embarrassing or something. We, we could, we'll just say, make ourselves really old. Well, let me, yeah. okay. Let's put it this way. That culture and the culture of Martin Luther King were fascinatingly different, but I yes. had LaGuardia kids inside my hall, inside those halls, inside my classrooms. I did. I had some really? in there. I had some. Now, would they have gone to LaGuardia? So folks who don't know New York City, if you say LaGuardia, it's like, um, it's famous, but also nerdy. Like you can expect a certain reaction. And if you say Martin Luther King High School, those are kids that are all coming from the Bronx, from Harlem and from some tough neighborhoods in Brooklyn. And uh, they're really not the same culture. I, you had you had different races, right? You guys were pretty diverse. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah, incredibly diverse. MLK, that was that was black kids. That mm -hmm. was all black kids. Almost almost entirely. And um, it's a really fascinating thing to cuz you can walk across like it's across the street. Literally. You walk, yeah. yeah, just walk right over there. Um, but I had kids in there, man, that they knew their business. They did not know they were an author or a writer or a painter or a dancer in the same way that somehow LaGuardia kids knew themselves. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. And I think what was interesting about, you know, that dynamic is that it wasn't necessarily, there wasn't like a class distinction per se, because you had kids that were just as rough and from the same yes. places yeah. as MLK kids. But I think you're right. It's like somewhere along the line, because nobody was pushing me to go to LaGuardia. This was like completely self-led. Hmm. I just found out about it and I was like, huh, maybe. And I tried out and I got in. But it's not like I 
was being, you know, I didn't have like a stage, stage mom, mom. Anything, yeah. Like, yeah. you know, like a, yeah. it was, um, I was really on my own, you know, doing all of this. And so, um, I mean, I don't, I think most of my peers, you know, came from working class, blue collar and poor mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. we had, you know, homeless kids, you know, just making it to school and showing up and singing. I think LaGuardia you know? is, you know, there's so many, I'm in the hinterlands. I'm in South Carolina mm -hmm. and you're a New Yorker, like to the bone. I'm, I, I kind of, I'm an adopted son through my wife and I lived there a long time though. Um, but people trash New York all the time, but they really shouldn't trash it all the time. If they should stop I dare you to trash that. it. I know. Right. I dare you. <laughs> I'm Get with you. I love up. it. <laughs> I'm telling you. There's so many gold nuggets. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The administration of a 7 million person city is not easy, but there's so many gold, so much gold in that town. Stuff yeah, that and I, I think love. The, I think oh, the go gold ahead. really is in the communities that have been there a That's long time. That's what I'm saying. I agree with that. Yeah. And LaGuardia is a brainchild, right, of these, these engineering minds. And I don't mean math minds. I mean, people who are engineering a community called New York all throughout the, you know, the late the 19th century and, and into the 20th century. And they, they did a good job to bring all those diverse kind of characters together to, to, to make beautiful things. Yeah. And um, that kind of stuff is very rare in history. It's beautiful. But this, so yeah. then you go on to, is it School of Visual Arts and then Parsons? Do I have that in the right order? I went to Parsons for my undergrad and then School of Visual Arts for grad school many years later. After did I'd you, already been an illustrator. Did you, there's a common story with people who have a skill set in something like the arts. Did you realize you could keep up when you were in LaGuardia and be able to go on and do it? Or was there an intimidation factor that you had to I overcome? I mean, there, were, there was always a, you know, I think a sense of healthy competition uh, in the same way that kids who were very academic might compete for good grades or something like that. There was definitely a, a, a yeah, a healthy sense of competition and somewhat of a hierarchy, I would mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. It really did push you to be your best. But then as time went on, you realized that there were actually like diverse ways to be good at something. For instance, in the art department that I was in, the abstract expressionist painters definitely held like the highest position of I esteem see. and us lowly illustrators who you actually did want to draw figuratively. We were kind of low on low in the totem pole there, but, uh, but among us in our little nerdy illustrator bubble, there was definitely like, Oh, let's try to draw the hands this way. Oh no. Like, you know, you didn't get That's that so thumb great. right. You know, I love that stuff. It was so granular. It was just awesome. Like, oh, do you like using this color gouache? Like, oh, look what he did in this comic book. You know, it was just so geeky. But it was fulfilling. It must have been Very. so fulfilling. Yeah. Father you don't feel like you don't oh, feel like such a you, you don't feel like such a an oddity. You know? Everything's just very normal. You know? Right. You have you know, cult. The word cult. You know, we know it as all this bad stuff, but the cult is where all the people go who want to share in something profound. And so, yeah, cults can get out of it, but that's what culture is, you know. And when someone finds that cult they cre and create a culture, I think all of us want that. I actually think that's one of the problems in America is we, we, we reject anything that looks like I'm conforming to something else, which is kind of dumb because... You think you're like the person that did it that doesn't have to conform to to, to ideas that already exist? It, it seems dumb, right? Like, yeah, I'm, kind of this sense that oh, I'm the first person to ever feel this way, or I'm the right. first person to have this struggle or something. And then you know, if you get with your people, you know, you realize oh, there's actually a commonality. And I I think it's almost like a recovery of the kind of uh, artisan guild system. Yeah, you know yeah, that yeah. in a in a traditional society, you would kind of know your place. You would know, oh, I'm the one, I'm the icon painter, or I'm the scribe, or I'm the, you know, I'm those who work, those who pray, and those who fight. You know, you would be yeah, in one of those right. three that's categories, right. and within that, you would kind of know 
what, what's expected of you. And you would have people who came before you and people who came after you so that you're part of this continuum and you don't, you know, feel this pressure to reinvent the wheel every year, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the ancients, I think, you know, Aristotle's going to, he's going to do broadsides against the individual. He's going to basically call the, a, a person who believes in themselves as separate from the group is an idiot actually in the greek is an idiota so they're dumb they're not good they're a scourge because they don't see their role to play within the body whether it's the body politic or the politic or the body of, of artistry you know the body of the family you're always playing a role there is no independent you and um i find that very evident now, but I wasn't, I, I didn't at 25. I think I was supposed to do something special on my own as if I had to prove, you know, like, you know, this, I don't do this anymore with any kids that I ever meet, but never tell a kid at eight, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Like, what do you want to do when you grow up? I get real nervous about this. Like, I'm going to be who I am now, but older. <laughs> like it's kind of freaky that so I have to totally transform myself into something valuable oh okay it's Tuesday like that's terrifying it's a lot mm -hmm. it's a lot I think our culture puts that pressure on a little bit so then what yeah. happened you got nominated for a lot of stuff I think you're 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 deeply involved still in creating and you know developing your professional life um what should we look for? Are you working on something now? Yeah, I'm, I'm working on many, many things at once, always. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I make books. I write and illustrate young adult historical fiction. That's my sort of main thing that I do. And I also illustrate picture books. So at the moment, I'm in various stages of illustrating four picture books. And I'm uh, working on a new novel. Nice. So, yeah. Can you hint at it a little or not? Yeah, not it's yet. about the 80s. Is it? It's about the 80s, yeah. It's about the 80s. It's about the Berlin Wall. Nice. It's about music. It's about how awesome the 80s were. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just reading an article about the, or actually from the 80s, about mm -hmm. the role of wealth in society. It was pretty interesting, mm. actually. That's interesting because in the 80s, like wealth was. It's the point. It, it was unapologetic, you know, the pursuit of wealth, right? And yeah. you see that in all those John Hughes movies, for example, you mm -hmm. know, like the class distinctions and stuff in a way that now there's this, there's this real guilt about having money, you know, yeah. that you can't just have money and you certainly can't be conspicuous about it. Right. You know, you have to do some kind of social good with it, which right. is fine. You know, that's it, it probably true, be. but it's, it, it's the, it's the guilt part that I buck up against. Well, yeah. delve into that. What is the, I think there's a natural guilt. I feel it. I mean, not that I have much money. The point is though, when you, when you have it, there's a natural inclination to, to feel guilty. Now, is it natural? What do you think? Or is it, are we being taught that about money? I mean, I'm, I'm not somebody who's ever had a lot of money. So uh, I don't know. I just know that I don't resent people with money because I think, right. well, they do a lot of things. It's not like they swim through it like Scrooge McDuck, you know, swimming through the gold <laughs> or something like that. You know, people with money, like they, they have things to do and they do it. But I think that, you know, as we've lost the kind of uh, Christian paradigm for normative things like giving charitably as part of your just normal everyday life or the, the life of the church or the life of your community right. or something, then, you know, a different kind of moral structure comes to play, hmm. you know, and there's a lot of guilt and shame being bandied about that isn't Christian necessarily. You know, it, it's, it's not, it, it's not that, put, put the religious part and the moral part of Christianity aside. It's like, that is the paradigm that held our society together for 
yeah. you know, 2000 years. And now that is being replaced by something else. But the impulse to moralize is still present. That's right. You know, so sure. I, I don't know. I, I haven't actually thought about this all that much. So no, I like it. We're working it out. That's one of the cool yeah. things about our little show. We just, we'll just work it out because yeah. you made me think one of the problems with Marxism is that it, philosophically the, the value point or the, the place of value is something like taking away wealth. So the narrative is about removing wealth as an act of goodness like removing wealth from the, a certain class, the bourgeoisie. And the act of removing their wealth has its own value. And right. because they no longer have it, it means, therefore, that they're more like the majority. But there's no intrinsic value in taking something away from someone. I mean, no. right. In fact, and, it, it's taking something away from someone is actually prohibited in the Judeo-Christian yeah. worldview. It's seen as what it, it's antithetical to like the, the 10 commandments, the, the most basic foundational right. morality that, that we have in that paradigm. So I think the, the issue that I take with a Marxist frame is, is the teardown itself. It's the, it's right. The, Right. Yeah, it's it's the the upholding of the deconstruction and the teardown as a moral good in itself. And it's like, well, sure, you can tear something down, but if you if your purpose in tearing it down is not to build something better and you have a pretty good plan of what that is, then it's just de de destruction for its own sake. Yeah, that doesn't yeah. seem to make sense to me and that that that's deeply anti-human, I think. It's, it's I, misanthropic. Yes, misanthropic. I remember I wrote a, uh, a piece for, our, for my Substack, and it was investigating the role. Do you remember during the pandemic? Well, really, it was happening, maybe still happening, where people were getting Venmos, and then like the white people would Venmo to the black people. Do you remember that? Vague, that, that, vaguely, like after George George Floyd, like out of yeah. guilt, you mean, or yeah, yeah, like a and reparations was, kind of effect or something. Yeah, there was a, there were whole companies, and my article was about one of one of the companies. I had gotten a hold of some emails from this company. It, it, I kept it. It's I didn't put the company under the under the bus, but and the emails were long. I mean, there are hundreds of them where people were saying, "Here's here's my Venmo." Um, you know, I'm black bi or black straight or whatever, and send me some dough. And then people in the company would say, okay. And it was expected essentially that the, there was a transfer of wealth within that company uh, in little bits, 25, 50, 100, from those who had the benefits white to those who had no less benefits black. And so uh, it was fascinating reading them because it was nuts that, I could have figured out if the value was in black folks getting money <laughs> or in white folks losing money. It felt more like the value was that a certain group of people lost the money. Yes. Yeah. And I'm, as you know, Christian, Christian, like the essence, almost like almost the very core is, is that our things are not ours. And where they we have them, they are actually for others. And we just don't know in what guise yet. <laughs> like, I am going to give you my life. I'm going to give you these things. I don't know who and, and, and when, but I'm not, I'm not for this world. So I don't own the, it's not like taking them with me, like in some Egyptian, you know, crypt. I, I am literally not meant for these things. But I have them now so that I might live and that I might gift others. So I'm all about giving what I have. The problem is, is that's not what was going on. Right. I would think within a company, you would have people that are more or less in the same kind of class structure. That's how they right? got that. So, right. That's how they know each other. So, so giving it, so it's not charity. It feels very compulsory, mm -hmm. feels guilt-based, 
it's not from a cheerful heart. Like the, the Christian paradigm of giving the Jewish paradigm of giving is, is out of out cheerfulness of and a desire to a desire for human flourishing that kind of assumes that we're part of each other, not separate. So beautiful. You know, and I think it's puzzling to me, I think, because of my background that I don't see these distinctions as clearly as I think either younger people or people who haven't grown up in integrated cultures. Mm. It's like they're trying to make up for something that they assume that they lacked. Right. Right some sort of morality that they assumed that they lacked growing up or something. And there's also, by the way, I, we could even talk about hatred of parents, you know, and hate. Oh, I think of, it, pl- I think it plays in. Yeah. You know, you know, in Africa, I want to go back to your, to your background though. I'll, I'll hold my question. I was just going to say in two seconds that in traditional old world societies, like places where we work, Georgia or West Africa, the inheritance is always first understood as positive. Like I'm inheriting the land of my father slash good check. Good. You know, I'm inheriting the nose of my mother slash check. Good. Because it's my mother. Like now you may wake up to the idea that your mom's nose is also, you know, I don't know, cancerous at some point, but the idea that the things your parents are giving you are first bad that's a real new invention, man. And that's the psychology I hear a lot in young people. Well, I've got to overcome what my dad did to me. Like, whoa, whoa, Well, whoa. Uh, yeah, and I, I think, um, I mean, we're talking a lot about nowadays the, the over-therapization of, of our children. You know, that's in the, that's in the air. Big time. You know, and this, this assumption that de facto, like my parents have have harmed me just by virtue of the fact that they are parents, right. you know? And, you know, I, I've talked about this on other podcasts and, and stuff like my, my background is actually, it actually is very terrible. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of capital T trauma there, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, brokenness. And yet it has never occurred to me to define myself by that or yeah. to let those things limit me. If anything, it's like, oh, I am a conscious individual. Sorry, Aristotle. But I have like the choices in front of me to be able to choose differently than the than my family of origin without destroying my family of origin. Like I don't need to tear wow. that down in order to build my thing. In fact, m- by me building my thing, I can actually kind of retroactively begin to heal what's behind me. That's right. You know what I mean? I, that seems to me a much more worthy project. Well, it, it makes you a partner in the yeah. growth of the family, even the growth of a family that has fallen asleep. That's, that's behind you. You're still mm-hmm. participating in their, in their existence and you're, you're growing into, but you do have to have a moral sense of sainthood. In other words, there does have to be an idea that there is a destination for this, what you're describing and what I'm describing to work. It, yeah. Otherwise, in the evolutionary sense, I've just inherited shit. Now I got to work with my shit mm-hmm. and I'm going to die. And on some level, those people made this life crappy for me. But if you see it in a long stretched out sort of way, you can start to realize that everything before has given you this moment to, to sort of continue towards something saintly or heavenly or, or I like the word impossible because Christianity paradoxically asks you to be perfect and knows you can't. (laughs) And, and to me, that's hopeful. Mm -hmm. It's hopeful. But I think for a lot of people, at least I think in the evolutionary model where we're sort of like faded monkeys, Mm -hmm what you inherit gets, gets pretty heavy. You know what I mean? It gets mm-hmm. like, it kind of screws you on some level in the evolutionary model. Well, I think that when you factor God into it and you factor a, a personal God who loves you 
into the equation, mm. then there's a certain stable foundation from which to begin that project of healing both front, front and back, you know, like forwards yeah, and backwards, yeah, yeah. you know? And it's like, oh, okay, I'm safe in the sense that I'm securely loved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I can face the real ugliness of whether it's my past or whether it's things I've done or have been done to me or the ugliness of the world, which right now, like, you know, is constantly right, right. Threatening, threatening to bowl me over. Mm -hmm. But I know, yeah, like you're saying that, that there is a long view to this. It's I'm not assuming that it's ending with me and mm -hmm. my problems. It's like, no, I have. So for example, uh, um, I had a really dark childhood, but I had these books and like those stories went really deep. And I feel like I was given some tools. I was okay. Like I put them in my tool belt and now I can move forward and work with the material I've been given. I'm actually really grateful for it. Right. You know, I wouldn't well, you change a thing. You were confronted. Can I say this? Tell me if this sounds right. You were confronted with a story that you're both in, but you have to strive to participate with. Like, in other words, you weren't just you. You weren't just what you inherited. You were also participating in a story that's bigger than you. This is what Christianity always felt like to me. Yeah. It always felt like, um, oh my gosh, it's like, it's like bigger than me. We're all on this boat, this ark, and we're going somewhere and there's a captain and all of this is like bigger than me. And it's, it's really beautiful when you, but it takes a while to get to that point in our society. I don't think Christianity always is given to us that way. Were, were you Christian coming up? What, what, how did, what were you working with spiritually when you were uh, a young writer? <laughs> a young writer or a young, or a well, young human. How about a young, a young human? human? Okay. So it's, it's kind of, I'm, I have a multivariate experience here. I, uh, my grandparents were Episcopalian and when I was four, my mom married a Jewish man. And so I was, she converted, I was raised Jewish, raised in a Jewish home. Oh, interesting. So, and as I get older, that upbringing becomes more and more concrete, like more concrete, not less to me. Interesting. And I, yeah. So I really do consider myself like a Judeo Christian, you know? Um, I, I, I never became bat mitzvah or anything like that. Um, my parents, uh, my mom and my stepdad split up before that could have happened. But, um, but that story went really deep too. And I'm, I'm just like, I'm beginning to uncover more and more and more of the, the miracle of being born into that story and being Gosh. raised in that story. You know, it's, it's, it's really rich. incredible. It's so rich. And it's, it's like, I don't know, the older I get, the more like a miracle this all feels at the same time that it feels like it's crumbling down around me. It's like, I, I'm, I'm kind of preserved in this like cocoon of amaze, amazement. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's fascinating. And so the mm -hmm. Orthodox Christianity part comes. So, yeah. So I've been a Christian for, I had, um, I'm going to refer because I, I don't want to take our time with this, but like, I'm going to refer your listeners to an interview I did on pints with Aquinas. So you oh, can find it on okay, YouTube. Super. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. Guy. So where I tell like my whole story and everything, but, um, the short version of it is that I had a miraculous encounter with Jesus when I was 16 and have been, like tight with him ever so like tight <laughs> okay for 30 years and um so we only became orthodox last year so we've been like in the church as you know either inquirers or catechumens or orthodox for about three or four years something like that mm -hmm. but our whole family came into the church together last year wow so that's been a wild ride <laughs> that's your immediate family your kids with ben yeah. And, so Ben and I and our two adult children. Yeah. Oh, so you, okay. So you're like, so a lot of this crew that we hung out with, and I know yeah. there's this, the creatives, or I don't know what the title is for Jonathan Peugeot and uh, Father Silouan, I think Ben, you on some level, you guys all have worked together for more than just like the last couple of years. You've known each other for a while, right? So Jonathan and I met, I think before COVID, something like that. And I was on his channel 
um, once or twice, and he was on my podcast, my my podcast, which is on pause at the moment, hopefully to be resurrected. Oh, I want to uh, I want to go on your podcast. I, well, I'll have you on my podcast when it relaunches, but it's called I'll Vesperisms. Out to say. Vesperisms, very nice. Yeah, and there's a good back catalog there. It's like it's about artistic thinking, basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so I know Jonathan from a little bit back, um, before that in the before times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot changed. It, a lot did change. Yeah. It was just interesting kind of, uh, meeting this crew in the same way that my high school crew felt like, oh, we, we kind of all found each other and are walking in the same direction and geeking out about the same things. It's kind of nice. Yeah. I think that knowing my dear friend, Father Silouan, who's also my godson, that feels like the kind of people that he's collected or have he has been collected by mm -hmm. over these years. And they really feed him as an artist. Yeah. And he's also fun that way. So yeah, we find each other. Yeah, I know. It's beautiful. Yeah. So we were talking before we hopped on, maybe we'll go into this a little bit and then, I don't know, we can finish or not. I like talking to you. Uh, well, we're friends now, so we're going to see yeah. each other. Plus, yeah. you're going to like this this event. It's very chill, and it's a lot. It's a lot of good deep stuff, but also a proper celebration um, out in Washington. But so you're telling me about this dream, and this dream was really about about love, but maybe about layers of love that that need to be understood. Um, Mm -hmm. as as multi you know look, tell, can you tell us the dream i mean i i can i have it we wrote it down and stuff but yeah what was going on in in this dream of yours well i'll preface it by saying that you know love is something that i'm coming by honestly in life you know in other words i'm not naturally one of these very like nice people that you would meet and say, Oh, she's so full of love. You know, I, I'm, I feel like I do love much because I've been forgiven much, but I don't always know how to express it. And so yeah, I had to get yeah. the word love tattooed, literally tattooed on my writing arm. So I would remember <laughs> wow. to always pursue it. So for me to have a dream about love in this way was it kind of, I don't know. And it took me by surprise. So I, I think I'll read it because it's short. I would love for you to. It feels and I like had the a little uh, of, a, of a story. It feels like something's going to happen with this. Well, I actually started writing it into the new book. Mm. And, uh, you know, I don't write nonfiction. So when I say writing it into the new book, I mean like it's, characters are going to be experiencing this in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me read this. I was in a town square where two young doctors, a man and a woman, were trying to diagnose a young lady who had nothing wrong with her, but they were convinced something was nonetheless. The male doctor held up a pen-like tool to the lady's forehead and clicked it, and it left a small circle with a hole in it. And the woman doc had three of these marks on her forehead herself. The young lady was protesting, but it was in vain because they had her cornered. Now, many people were gathered in this town square, and the vast majority were teens and young adults. They were all experiencing this desire for re-enchantment, the kind that we've been hearing about, you know, so many people are talking about it. And they were trying on all of these sorts of aesthetic approaches to enchantment, the way they dressed, the way they talked, the way they did their hair, the way they, you know, expressed themselves. And this girl's voice was singing a pop song about this re-enchantment phenomenon. And all these kind of pretty things started happening everywhere. So, for example, mm. a group of butterflies flew out from a gazebo as she was singing. And there were colors floating around in the air. Like, everything felt very magical. And people had the instinct to be together in this effort. There was even this group that was trying to cook the world's largest frittata. But it was the wrong expression of this because over in another corner, there was somebody who was just cooking very lovingly, cooking two eggs over lightly for this other person that they were mm -hmm. with. And that was the kind of intimacy that was needed and that people were really looking for. So as the girls sang, the punchline of the chorus was that the one thing that none of their generation knew how to do was, ready for it, fall in love. It was like a love song about not knowing how to fall in love. 
And I woke up immediately and I knew that that was it. That was what we needed in this time. Okay, so here I started writing the, the dream down and this is what came to me like immediately right after the dream. Many young people are coming into the Orthodox Church, for example, partly for its depth and its richness and its rigor and intellectual offerings and even its sensory aesthetic. They've diagnosed part of the problem starting out by thinking that it has something to do with the mind, yeah. which is fair. But like other trends, if it has not love, it has nothing. Like the two quack doctors at the beginning of the dream. And I would refer people to Jonathan Peugeot's recent interview of Justin Brierley about the fall of new atheism, because it made me think about these kinds of trends of, you know, when people try to find meaning in, in a movement. Mm. Now, people will not find what they're looking for without the romance of the gospel, which is God marrying himself to his people and to each individual person. And in particular, this expressing itself through literal earthly marriage. Without this paradigm, people will either leave the church saying that Christianity was yet one more thing that didn't deliver, or they'll stay and join the frozen chosen. Yes. The love that was in this dream and the love that I understood it to be is a pure, chaste love. It's a courtly love. It's a new expression of the chivalric. Mm. But it has to be cultivated and even has to be taught because it's been lost for a few generations. And those who possess this kind of love right now have a treasure whose worth they cannot begin to perceive. In an age saturated with the kind of obsession over sex that leads to sexlessness and impotence and despair, the recovery of love is everything. This is the kind of reenchantment that will last and that will endure suffering and tribulation. It's the love that Jesus revealed in his high priestly prayer in John 15 to 17. So here is the crux of the matter. We must in this moment of reenchantment learn how to fall in love again. That's it. Okay. We needed to start with that. What a dummy I am. This is so rich. Well, let's go with this for a second. All right. Okay. I kept hearing Eros. It's so funny that you just said that. Okay. Because here's the thing. I'm te this is why I said at the outset, I'm not the love guru, okay? I'm not the one you come right, to right. to learn about courtly love and eros. And yet, a couple of weeks ago, Martin Shaw asked me to speak in his school. So I'm going to be speaking in the fall at his school of myth. Nice. And what is, and he didn't tell me any of this, okay? He like asked me if I would speak at his school. And then the next day he made the announcement of who was going to be the speakers. And he put me on the class about eros. And I was like, okay. <laughs> well, guess what? That's what? what that is about. What? Yeah. That's why you have are having this dream. That's why this dream is going to make it into your book, and that's why you got invited. I, I, it's. I mean, look, we don't know these things except for we know these things if we pay attention. Yeah. Yep. Wow. It, I was. I want to say it's Saint Maximus, but I don't think it was. But. I know that he speaks like this. I, I was just reading it and I know it's not St. Maximus, but it was that the Holy Spirit, God hovered above the dark, the empty, the nihil, the nothing, and the nothing desired being. In other words, the nothing, the thing that was before creation that God gave to, to being, being itself desired, right, to be desired God, and it became thus. And so there's something about Eros, the strong desire, that's built right into the DNA of, of creation. And it feels like we've forgotten how to, it feels like a devilish trick. It feels to me like Eros has been confused with a simple, simple sexual ugliness right and and in that sense we stopped talking about it as a whole and to me it's sad and that dream of yours it's it's kind of sad it has a it's a sad dream yeah you there was a sad hopefulness to it it was it was kind of like you were catching this group of 
of teens and young adults at the moment, at a very pivotal moment where it could kind of go either way, you know, like mm -hmm. they knew that what they had been given was like that their, their bowl of pottage, I guess, was like full of maggots. You know what I mean? Like they knew right, right, it wasn't right. right and that there was something better and they were trying to construct it but it was something that they, they couldn't construct. It needed to be given to them. It needed to be deposited. Wow. You know? And I think what's so interesting to me personally about this is that I write for young adults, like ostensibly I write for young, young adults, right? Like I, mm -hmm. I write in the young adult genre. Mm -hmm. However, I mostly don't like that genre. I'm sorry. I hope my publishers don't listen to this, but like <laughs> I find so much of that genre to be very disrespectful to young people and to how they actually think and operate and feel. And it just, it feels a lot like adults trying to put their own stuff onto teenagers oh, at I the see. time where they should actually be like lifting them up and giving them navigational tools through not moralism, but like, but through beauty and good literature. And, yeah, that's right. You know what I mean? So that's kind of like the approach that I'm taking. I, I may write about young adults, but I'm really kind of just trying to pull this forward for myself, you know, mm -hmm. and recover, like recover a sense of Eros and recover a sense of like, of hopefulness about the world. Do you think the publishers make a common mistake I've seen in education. Do you, do you think they make the mistake that your young readers can handle the, the deep beauty? Like they can't handle it. We have to give them something more akin to happy rather than joy or do you think they make that think, mistake? I don't even think happy enters into it. I, what I think is that we've in, the, in, in a sort of Disney century, right? This like Disneyfication of all of these stories. The tendency has been to sanitize the stories, right? And then there's been a reaction to that, which has said, oh, well, kids can handle a lot more hard stuff than we think they can. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like the edgier and the harder that you can be and the more kind of like twisted paranormal or occult or sexual stuff that you can put in there and the more of a like an emotional rise you can get out of your readers, then you're considered to be like on the cutting edge of it. It's like, and I just think it's usually not good storytelling. <laughs> it's right. usually you can kind of feel the author's agenda. And I don't, I don't think that that's fair for, for people who are coming into adulthood and like looking to understand the world that's in front of them. How do you try to, What's the DNA of your stories? It, it, we'd love to hear that as from the author. So what are you trying to do that may be a little different than what you just described? Well, I think I'm just trying to tell the truth. And the foil that I kind of use is I, I really love history and I have questions about how yeah. normal everyday people lived in extraordinary times. Like that's kind of the the rough material that I'm working with. But then also that these historical periods keep rhyming with each other. I don't, I don't necessarily think they're cyclical, but they're, they're resonant, you know? Yeah, and so nice if I said. write about the plague of 1348 and it happens to come out during COVID, which was a total coincidence, well, then maybe that there's something that uh, God is trying to tell us about how to navigate our own times through that. Right. So, you know, these are very unusual times, but they're not unprecedented in a certain sense. And the kids that are coming up now just have a sort of new set of challenges that they have to navigate with. But I want to recover things like, you know, especially after I had this dream, I was like, oh, my, I just want to write my next novel about falling in love. Like, that's what I want the whole story, the whole book to be about. And not necessarily like, oh, I'm writing a romance or something like that. No. I want to no. be able to recover that sense of that, like, aching, hungry, beautiful first love, you know, so that people can maybe recognize it again. That's so you know? Beautiful. This is, that's, you're making me think, for God so loved the world. 
Yeah. Creation exists is because God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, overflow. In other words, their love overflows, and that overflow is creation. Mm -hmm. And so we exist in love, which is a freaky concept, which is like, though it, you appear to me, right, as something called a woman with beautiful hair, and you're actually Thanks. love before me. And I venerate you. Because it's pretty cool. I, I see right, I see the magnificence of creation in you, which is love. Now, what problem is, is it becomes, you know, like everything, it becomes trapped in the marketplace, it becomes, yeah. it becomes sold. And I'm not afraid of that word. I'm so thankful to have had you on here because there's a couple words I'm not afraid of love and beauty. They don't, I like to overuse them. They're not, not over you. Well, hello, we're living at a pre-Christian time. Okay. Right. We are back in a brutal, brutalizing and brutalized time period I where know. everything is ugly. It's not over you. Beauty and love are not overused. It's as though we've never heard them before. And why would we be afraid of that? It's I the know. most amazing and miraculous time because unlike the pre-christian world 2000 years ago we now have the benefit of hindsight that's right that's right we can look at like even how christianity sort of like lost itself and and devolved yeah. into something that it's its opposite and now we can be like oh actually we have some we have some historical rhymes that we can pull from right. you know to understand where we're at and it's so exciting well, well, you're making me think we have the incarnation. Now, here's what I mean, though. Like, we actually have the idea that the creator became the creature. We actually have that as a story and as a reality and as a truth that yeah. we can point to, which is what's more, like, beautiful than that. And And you can... If you can point to it and if you can see it, then what happens is, is all the other ugliness, it can, it fades, it fades. It, you don't have to live in that space. The incarnation allows you to stay. Now it sounds Pollyanna to the atheists, but it allows you to stay in a place of beauty, even when someone's dead in front of you. It's pretty yeah. crazy. It's pretty crazy. No, there's nothing Pollyanna about it because it's in the midst it's in the sorrow, it's in, you know, it's in that rough, raw, there's nothing sanitized about what I'm talking about. Right. Well, there's nothing sanitized about the crucifixion and the resurrection. Yeah, you're right. No. It's, it's a mess. It's a mess. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So then as, as a writer and then, you know, as a creative person who's trying to put stuff in the world, do you think there's an outlet for the kind of stuff we're talking about through through art, will artists be respected and published slash, you know, put into the public if they think like we're talking? Do you think it's happening? I feel like it's happening on some level. So here's my take on it. Okay, is that that whole um, that whole cancellation thing? That's over. Like Feels people need to not mean. occupy their minds with that at all anymore this fear of being canceled or whatever. The only thing before us is to make good stuff because the hunger for it is there. You know, we know this through polling data. We know, like, we know that people are just over all of this, that they're exhausted, they're tired, and they're, they're making choices with their purchasing power in terms of the kinds of movies they want to see, in terms of like places they want to live and whatever, whatever it is, whatever you can spend your money on that's okay. And I'm seeing books being picked up by friends of mine, for example, which I can't even say, but like, and like internal conversations happening within the industry where it's like, they, they know. So no more fear. It's just, it's time to tell a good story and it's going to get, you know, if you're really good at your craft and you're not, and you're not writing moral tales, <laughs> Right, right. I That's know the one mean. thing you cannot do. That's the one thing, like, nobody wants to be preached at. That's right. Nobody wants to, if you're a writer, if you're, an, you know, an artist of any kind, you can't break that fourth wall and, right. and let the 
viewer see what you think about something. It's like, no, you just tell the story, trust the story, trust the artwork, trust the painting, just do it, you know? Because mm -hmm. I think too, I, I believe that, you know, for those of us who are, are believers, like we receive revelation. So just like work with the revelation that you're given. It's, it's okay. You can do that. <laughs> I love what you're saying. And just to demystify that for some folks who are listening, it's not it, revelation is that which is revealed. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Could be a dream. It could also be the fact when I turn on the light and I walk into the room, Oh, Oh, there are my glasses. I, they, everybody thinks this is some like, Oh, like revelation that that's what yeah. the scientific mindset did to that word. But things are revealed to us all the time, like yeah. all the time. Our minds cannot contain the reality of all the meaning that constantly is being revealed to us. We yeah. didn't learn it through some process, some method. And that's what that's why artists, and I love what Peugeot talks about, we're just all artists. That's just ridiculous that there's like the artists over there. And then all of us are trying to be participate in creating beauty. It's just a matter of, you know, which medium you're in in any given moment. So. And, and the, you know, the, the weird thing in my dream about the world's largest frittata, you know what I mean? <laughs> like if you've ever seen The Big Night or Babette's Feast, you know that there's something beautiful and creative and artistic in just like making a meal that tastes good yeah. and having people around your table, you know, to get yeah. back to the art of Tamara, you know, there's something incredibly revelatory about, about that. That's right. Vesper, so now you're going to be like, have to come regular to this podcast. We were, this is so nice speaking to you. Like it's, I, um, I'll see you for sure in July. Um, but let's keep, let's keep talking. Um, I'm not joking about trying to get Ben to go to Mozambique for our work. No, he's um, excited about it. It's, it's it's around the corner. I talked to some of our um, our benefactors in from Moza who, who who are helping us in Mozambique. Their eyes sort of lit up. They didn't realize Ben wanted to do that, and I, that's my fault. Um, but I just want to thank you for being a pro. I think that matters for and for taking time. That was fantastic. I, I pray that uh, people will see this and come join us because you you might even do a little nature hike where you guys go out and sit and, 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 and draw, right? Yeah. We're going to do some drawing and it doesn't matter if you're not an artist. I love working with people who don't think they can draw, but it's just, nobody's demystified it for them. So I, mm. I love doing that. we we'll do some of that. Good. That's part of it. All right, guys, Vesper, uh, you're in New York City, right? Well, just are you just nor are you in the city? Yeah, you're. I'm, in the city. I'm outside of the city. Yeah. Yeah, outside. Yeah. So I'll come try to see you. My kid's graduating. I'll try to come see you in uh, in awesome. May, or maybe we can have coffee. Um, Very good. Best for Stamper, guys. Uh, thanks for coming on, and I'll talk to you again soon. Thanks. I just love hearing her stories. I want to go join her in New York for a coffee. That's what I'm doing. I don't know. If you guys want to go? Let's do it. We have to. By the way, the Art of Tamada, the tickets are for sale right now. There's only 25 of them. They're expensive in a good way. Like you get a ton of stuff. It's a good deal. I'm not even I'm not even gonna fight you on that. If it's too much, that's fine, but it's a good deal. But we have other ways to make things work. Give five dollars a month, give ten. You know what you're giving to? You're giving to young men and women who go for two years at a time to live in really, 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 how should we say it? Isolated places with beautiful people with not many options. And there they develop the most wonderful, creative, sustainable projects that help the community, but most of all, and as in addition, help the field worker to become a true human being. That's what we do, Peace Corps style with the spiritual edge. That's what we do. Check us out. Become a become a monthly donor. That's the coolest thing you could ever do. This is John. That was Vesper Stamper. See you next week. I can't wait. Peace out.